Hello, listeners. We want to let you know that we will be presenting at the Pennsylvania Society of Addiction Medicine annual meeting online on March 2nd. You can hear us speak and even see what we look like. After an extensively heated discussion, Sonia and I have picked the 10 articles that we reviewed which changed our practice the most. It's a little embarrassing, but we're going to put ourselves out there and tell you some of the things that we did wrong and how we changed our ways after reading these 10 articles. You can register for the conference at psam-asam.org. Hope to see you all there. This is Addiction Medicine Journal Club. I'm Dr. Sonia Del Tredici. And I'm Dr. John Keenan. We believe that addiction is a disease that can be treated, and we want to help you stay up to date with the latest research that you can use in your addiction medicine practice. This week, John is going to tell us about an article about what patients think the most important measures of success are in treatment for opioid use disorder. How are you doing, John? Uh, it's good. It's a it's a early fall spring here in central PA, and anyone that's not from Pennsylvania doesn't really kind of know about the the multiple fall springs that lead up to true spring. So um, certainly the weather is changing, and it's it's nice just to kind of be a little bit outside this week. How about you, Sonia? I'm doing great. I've had a great week at the office. Had a lot of fun with some residents today, and I'm looking forward to recording this podcast. It's awesome. So, John, is there anything you want to share with our listeners this evening? It's not really kind of a a typical news update, but I did think it was interesting. In CNN this week, they had an article, and it was about uh, chronic pain prescribing in the United States. And it was interesting because it kind of took almost the enantomer of what we normally talk about. It was really from the patient's point of view in terms of our chronic pain patients and and how essentially they don't feel like they can get the care that they were once receiving, even people that had kind of taken their medications as directed. And it was interesting because it really kind of pointed out that um, we all know about the CDC guidelines that came out in 2016 that kind of most of us practice based upon. And one thing that I think a lot of people took to heart was that they did put kind of limits on morphine equivalents for prescribing, which was something new that we hadn't seen before. And I think a lot of people took that to heart and we kind of altered our prescribing practices based upon this. And more and more physicians didn't prescribe opioids for chronic pain. And really what you've been left with is there is a group of patients that are on these medications that can't find a prescribing uh, physician or, or APP to take care of them. And it was somewhat critical of the fact that all these regulations have kind of come in and yet there really hasn't been any change in kind of our overdose deaths. In fact, you know, I think they're the highest in the the early COVID era. And so it talked about also how most recently in November, 2022, they updated these guidelines where really we kind of almost kind of met in the middle. We weren't talking about hard cutoff criteria, but more so kind of like individualized to the patient. So to kind of loosen guidelines, maybe that some physicians could take care of the niche that may benefit from kind of higher dosing and equivalencies. But I thought it was interesting just because I think we always talk about opioids from the other side, about all the harms. And I think we forget that there is a group of people that have kind of gotten stuck on this for one reason or another, and they're kind of left high and dry in the the kind of the war on prescribing here. I don't know. What do you think about that, Sonia? I think it's just a really difficult situation because patients who've been placed on long-term medications, not just opioids, but a bunch of medications that your body gets accustomed to and then no longer, you are no longer comfortable without them. That includes things like SSRIs and even things, blood pressure medicines, PPIs, things like that. We've kind of caused harm. The patients really do not do well without these medicines after we've exposed them to the medicines for years or decades. And it's an iatrogenic injury. And it is our responsibility to continue to work with people and not just to abandon them On the flip side, it's very hard to know when you're starting out prescribing or even when you're taking on a new patient, who is going to experience significant harms from opioids and who is going to do well. You know, you and I both have primary care practices, so we both prescribe opioids for chronic pain and we prescribe buprenorphine to treat opiate use disorder. And my opiate use disorder patients, almost all of them started opiates through prescribing. And when I look back and review their cases, the prescribing was almost all what would be considered inappropriate. And many of them curse the name of that doctor, whoever he or she was, who got them started. And they really feel that doctors ruined their lives, even though at the time they themselves asked for the opioids. And I don't want to be that kind of doctor who's ruining people's lives. But then you have patients who've been stable on chronic prescribed opioids for a long time. And it 
you can't abandon them either. And so I think this is a really difficult issue and I, I don't really have a great solution. But I do know there's a lot of work being done. I'm seeing calls on social media for studies that are looking at long-term chronic opioid patients who are losing access to their prescribers and trying to figure out what the trajectory is like for those people. So I think we'll know more in the future, but I just feel really bad for patients in the end. Yeah, it's tough. I feel like you're right. They're collateral damage, right? Especially there, there is a group that use their medicines as prescribed and now they're kind of stuck and I think they, you know, sometimes we we misinterpret their behavior a certain way, but really I think they're just desperate to kind of continue care the way that they've been receiving it. It's not an either or thing. I think that's what makes it hard. It's not that the opiates are either bad for you and you should stop them or they're helping you and you should continue them forever. Usually it's both. They're bad for you and risky and they are also helping you. And that's what makes these decisions difficult. So what's new with you in addiction medicine this week, Sonia? Well, I just wanted to give our listeners a chance to do a little bit of political activism. So as you may or may not know, the DEA is considering changing the requirements for treating opioid use disorder over telemedicine. And before the pandemic, you could not start buprenorphine for opioid use disorder over telemedicine. You had to conduct an in-person exam prior to initiating treatment. Then the pandemic came, as we all remember, and everything went out the window and you could prescribe buprenorphine entirely by telemedicine. That's like video visits or even phone call visits. This exception though, this pandemic exception is set to expire on May 11th and the DEA has proposed new rules that kind of split the difference. So they allow you to start treatment remotely, but the patient has to have at least one in-person visit sometime within the first 30 days. They say that this is to prevent diversion, And my guess is that they're also kind of uncomfortable with a bunch of online-only MAT practices that have appeared during the pandemic. So, John, what do you think of the proposal? Do you think that a doctor should have to see a patient at least once in person if they're going to treat them with buprenorphine for opiate use disorder? Or should it be okay to conduct your practice entirely by telemedicine? It's really hard. I think we have kind of like precedent with kind of telemedicine, prescribing of controlled substances that have kind of gone Poorly, I can think of some of the ADHD prescribing um, groups that were kind of shut down or pharmacies refused to participate with. There's really kind of no right answer here in, in my kind of mind. I think that they're trying to make a stance on diversion. This is the DEA, so the Drug Enforcement Agency. They can't kind of endorse diversion, even though we, we know that kind of in addiction medicine that at times diversion of buprenorphine actually helps other people. It's not necessarily a bad thing and not posing harm, but at the same time, token, you can't just kind of make it a free-for-all market with this. So I think they're trying. I don't know how much a single visit is going to decrease that. And I don't really know how much more of a burden that's going to be for kind of the online telemedicine companies that are actually trying to do things like this the right way. I don't know. What do you think? Well, I think the single in-person visit doesn't necessarily solve the problem. I think it just creates a big headache and a lot of expense for the all online practices. So to me, it seems like an intervention more designed to force those groups to have a brick and mortar site for some reason. So I don't think it's going to really prevent diversion. I think it just provides kind of an annoying hurdle for patients who want to get their care primarily by telemedicine. You know, I myself am not a telemedicine doctor, but I'm very comfortable with it. I think I saw three of my buprenorphine patients this afternoon on telemedicine. And it's all for good reasons. You know, one person, his work had a contract that was out of state. You know, I just did a phone call check in. Another person works third shift and, you know, really wanted to be able to sleep a little longer rather than drive an hour to my office and then drive back. You know, so telemedicine seemed like a good option for this person. So I like it. I think this rule is not going to do much and just provide a burden. I want to encourage our listeners to leave comments for the DEA. So whether you're for or against this rule, I heard from someone who attended the ASAM advocacy conference that comments from people with actual firsthand knowledge of the situation are very valuable to the DEA. So whether you think this is a great idea or a terrible idea, I'll put links in the show notes for where you can leave your comments. And I think the comment deadline is the end of March. So coming up pretty soon. So John, are you ready to tell us about our article? Yeah, I think I have a really kind of cool article that we can go through tonight. And I think most of the time I like articles that are practice changing. So I learn a new diagnostic test, a new medication to treat something, kind of a new um, kind of like duration or kind of expectancy for a disease course. Although the other group, which I don't really get that 
often in terms of like mainstream medical literature is like perspective changing articles. So things that kind of forced me to look at something differently. So the article is called Sorting Through Life, Evaluating Patient Important Measures of Success in a Medication for Opioid Use Disorder, MOUD, Treatment Program. And it's from Substance Abuse Treatment Prevention and Policy from January of 2023. So a little bit of a background, as most of us know, medication for opioid use disorder is the gold standard evidence-based treatment for opioid use disorder. Medications for opioid use disorder treatment is associated with longer treatment retention, decreased opioid use, decreased risk of overdose, decreased overall mortality, and increased quality of life. Despite the effectiveness of medications in treating opioid use disorder, treatment and retention remains limited in many settings. Traditionally, the literature has defined success in terms of program retention, adherence to treatment, and abstinence, which do not reflect the diagnostic criteria of opioid use disorder, so a discordance. Improving treatment engagement and outcomes requires consideration of a misalignment between the pragmatic and patient goals of treatment. Authors of a recent systemic review reported 12 domains of importance to people with opioid use disorder. While these included many traditional metrics, such as treatment retention and abstinence from drugs, It also placed an importance on improvements of daily life, physical health, and discontinuing medications for opioid use disorder treatment. So, Sonia, what do you define as success? That is the million-dollar question. I think my standards have lowered, maybe, over the years. And at this point, I'm just happy if people are alive and coming back to engage in treatment. So I, of course, want people to live their best lives and be happy. But as long as people are still alive then I view it as a success. And if they're coming in to talk with us and meeting with us and still coming back for help, I'm happy. And then I just want to help people meet their goals. So I've come to that definition of success, whereas I started out in addiction treatment, trying to get everybody to be 100% drug-free. And that included all drugs. The initial program I worked with was an abstinence-based program. So you were fired from the program if you used any drug, including marijuana, on top of your buprenorphine. I don't think you've lowered your standards. I think I would call the term you've evolved. I've evolved. Maybe I've raised my standards. So what is the clinical question here? The clinical question is, what is the priority of participant-driven measures of excess in medication for opioid use disorder treatment, so MOUD programs? So this study design, this is a different study than what we normally do. It was a qualitative study, and it had two arms of data collection. In the first arm, they did identification of items for a pile sorting task through a semi-structured interview with multiple participants. The second area of data collection involved completion of a pile sorting task and collection of relevant participant demographic data. And I'll talk about what a pile sorting task is coming up. The first part, so this was identification of items for the pile sorting task through the semi-structured interviews. They did a secondary analysis of 16 qualitative interviews of participants in an active medication for opioid use disorder treatment program. They were semi-structured interviews performed by a single interviewer via phone call or Zoom, and this was done from January 2020 to August 2020, which was during the COVID pandemic. Domains of interest included previous experience with medication for opioid use disorder treatment, motivation for treatment, personal goals within a treatment program, and self-identified measures of success. Participants received $20 for completing the interview. Interviews were transcribed verbatim and uploaded into qualitative data analysis software. Data was analyzed by four separate authors with a combination of priori and open coding to establish a code book. And priori coding was things like absence from opioids, while open coding was things that was derived from the patient's interview, like happiness. The code book was used to develop items for a pile sorting task, and the authors used any interview derived words or language when possible. So they tried to keep it to what the patients, how they phrased things like happiness or success um, to kind of keep it consistent with the um, study group. Inclusion criteria was you're 18 years or older, you're English speaking, you were an active participant in a medication for opioid use disorder treatment program. And this was out of this Project Home Health Services in Philadelphia. And this was basically a, a medication for opioid use disorder treatment program that was centered out of a kind of healthcare type institution. That So they had healthcare resources and provided healthcare to this group. And they were all uh, participants that had kind of lack of housing or housing barriers. Only 16 participants were done in terms of interview style to derive the first set of data, so relatively small. 
The second part of data collection was a pile sorting task. And this was basically uh, where they kind of determined where those previously derived data points came from. And so for this pile sorting task, uh, basically participants were asked to fill out a demographic survey. So things like age, race, ethnicity, gender, education level, housing status, history of SUD treatment, engagement with current uh, medication for opioid use disorder treatment. The interviewer laid out category tiles and then said to the participant, quote, imagine it five years from now, we run into each other on the street or in the grocery store. I see you and say, participant's name, it is good to see you. How are you doing? And you respond, I'm doing great. Everything is going well. We want to know how important each of these things are to you when you respond to that question and the definition of being successful in life or treatment. The interviewer then would hand them a predetermined pile of cards, asking them to sort them into four categories, high, medium, low, and no importance. The interviewer then asked the interviewee to sort the cards in each category in order of importance. They would take the high uh, category cards and sort them from most to least important. The interviewer asked if there was any cards in the pile that should have been there that weren't there, and then they gave them $10 to complete the task. The pile sorting data was analyzed using multidimensional scaling. Inclusion criteria was the same as before, and this population was 31 participants, three of which could not complete the task, so 28 were included in later analysis. What do you think of that so far, Sonia? I like how they used both measures that maybe the medical team came up with, but also measures that the patients came up with using the patient's own language. It makes sense to prioritize. It's a little hard because it's like the classic multiple choice test in medical school, like which one of these three things are you going to do first? And once you're in practice, you're kind of like, well, I'll do them all. So it can be hard to prioritize things if you want many things, but no, I think it's really good. I'm looking forward to hearing how it turned out. All right. So in terms of like, is this a valid trial? So the authors had no conflicts of interest. The study was funded by the Foundation for Opioid uh, Response Efforts. The study was non-randomized and qualitative in nature, so a little different than our normal RCTs. It was a small sample size, so only 16 semi-structured interviews, and there was data from 28 patients in the pile sorting task that was included for analysis, but there was a total of 31 for that. You know, the study population did lack diversity, which could limit generalizability of the results. Um, the patients of the study were experiencing chronic homelessness, so they likely had high social barriers to health, and that was part of the program that they were involved with. Interestingly, uh, patients were linked to a Project Home Health Services in Philadelphia to some sort of healthcare resources. So while they did have social barriers, they actually did have access to at least some degree of healthcare. So high social barriers, healthcare access to a certain extent. Patients in the group were exclusively receiving buprenorphine, so you could not limit this to other patients on naltrexone or methadone programs. The author actually self-critiqued the, quote, no importance designation, which I thought was interesting. They kind of like later on went back and thought that they wish they rephrased that um, because they thought it was somewhat ambiguous. Like, was it not important to the participant at all or was it simply not applicable, such as absence, for example? Was that very important absence from drugs early in recovery and maybe a patient later in recovery kind of not using drugs wasn't viewed as highly to them? So they thought that maybe there could be like a time dependent response to that, that they wish they could have sorted out a little bit better. What did you think about the validity of the trial? It asks a very different kind of question than our typical randomized controlled trials. But, you know, this kind of qualitative research is a whole different branch of research that I don't know as much about. And to me, it sounded great. So a little bit about the results. Okay, so the first one, this was the results from the semi-structured interview. And just to kind of recap, so the semi-structured interview was supposed to derive basically your data point values for the next task, which was the pile sorting. I actually found this the most interesting part of the entire study. So in the semi-structured interviews, they did analysis of 16 of these. They identified through this software and analysis 23 recurrent themes of the pile sorting task. So they had 23 themes off the bat they identified from the structured interviews. In addition to the 23 that were identified by the pile sorting task, the authors and research team basically added six classic metrics of success for patients with opioid use disorder treatment in terms of program uh, success. And so these were by the team. They were not derived from the patients through those interviews. And these were the six that they added that weren't included from the patients. Negative urine drug screens. 
not getting arrested or violating my probation, being tested for HIV or hepatitis C, decreasing how often I go to the hospital or emergency room, decreasing how often I overdose, having less physical pain, which I think is crazy because th- that does that sixth list sound familiar to you? Right, exactly. That's like our checklist about what we're trying to do for people. And also I noticed some of those items are connected to perhaps our paychecks you know, goals that our health systems will set overall for us. Yeah, that, that I think that was amazing. If I took nothing away from this, the fact that that was added in, I think that that automatically reflects, that was kind of perspective shocking to me. I would have thought, like, especially the overdose part of it, I was very surprised by that. So basically they took the 23 uh, themes identified from the interviews and then they added these six to come up with 29 items for the pile sorting task. So the pile sorting task, as I said before, there was 31 patients that were initially sent to do the task. Three were not included. Basically, they couldn't complete the task. A little bit about this group from the demographic perspective, median age was 41. Most were male at 71%. Most were white at 54%. Most people had basically graduated high school or had their GED 54.6%. 57% lived in their own or in in an apartment or their own dwelling. Uh, The median age of first opioid use was 24. Drug of choice was overwhelmingly heroin and fentanyl at 71.4% of the patients. 46% had used heroin and fentanyl in the last 30 days. So basically half the patients were still relatively in early recovery or wouldn't even meet the definition for early recovery. 54% of the patients were taking buprenorphine seven days per week. So, you know, half the participants weren't even taking the medication every day. Most reported previous treatment for opioid use disorder, 93% had a previous outpatient treatment, 82% an inpatient treatment, 68% had an absence-based group program in the past, 68% had done individual therapy, and 57% were at one point in the methadone maintenance program. 46.4% participated in the current program for one year or less, so basically 50-50 if you've been in it for a year or more. In terms of the pile sorting task, they they basically did two things, frequency and then also median distribution. In terms of analysis for frequency, in terms of the high importance task, the most common item that came up was stable housing with 25 people putting stable housing into the high importance task. This was followed by no opioids, that was 23 patients, no physical dependence, 23 patients, being happy, 22, feeling neat and clean, 22, optimism, 21, self-worth, 20, and no arrest, 20. Of medium importance, the most common one was sense of community at 17, attending groups, 12, and handling frustrations, 12. And the low importance group, decreasing ED hospital visits was three, decreasing overdose, six, having a sense of community, six, absence from all drugs, six, and less pain, six. The most common no importance category was being tested for HIV or hepatitis C at 10 patients, decreasing overdose was 10, decreasing ED hospital visits was eight, and decreasing use of opioids was seven. So that was just overall frequency in terms of those four main bucket categories. Aren't the the bottom bucket with least importance, all the things that we added in that the doctors kind of want for people? Yeah, and then they looked at ranks. They looked at within each category where something was median. So they basically, the median rank within each category, and this was basically to try to eliminate outliers. So like a lot of people could find something highly important, but all of them could feel that it's the least highly important item. So this was trying to sort that out. So in terms of the highest median rank from the high importance category, it was abstinence from all drugs. That was rank two. Stable housing was followed that very closely at rank four. Uh, Not using opioids, uh, median rank five. And being happy, median rank five. In the median importance category, most common was decreasing opioid use um, with a median rank of 1.5 and then reconnecting with family with a median rank of two. Low importance, not using opioids was median rank one, decreasing opioid use, median rank 1.5. Not using other non-opioid drugs was also median rank 1.5 and then reconnecting with family at 1.5. At no importance, um, it was absence from all drugs and not being physically dependent were both kind of at median rank one. For this qualitative analysis, they did what's called multidimensional scaling. So this is a a statistical analysis kind of unique to qualitative research. And basically what they did is they kind of mapped out that people that felt one item was important, how often they felt like another item was often important. So like, for example, if I don't want to do, if I feel like not using opioids is important, 
did that actually relate to statistically or kind of like from this kind of multidimensional scaling that also they felt that cleanliness was important or, or was housing important. So they tried to find clusters of importance amongst people. And really what they identified is they identified three main clusters that patients felt were important. So three multidimensional scaling clusters of patient-derived important um, uh, data. And there was one overall redeeming large cluster. The, the primary cluster that had the most data behind it really was broken down to three subcategories. It was emotional well-being. So that included optimism, happiness, sense of self-worth, decreased drug use. So no opioid use, no physical dependence human functioning with stable housing and being neat and clean kind of being the most important factors. And that was the largest cluster of data in the study. There was two secondary clusters. One was could be classified into buprenorphine groups. So attending group, being honest, contributing to groups, and then a tertiary cluster that was basically traditional uh, buprenorphine success uh, metrics. Like, am I taking my suboxone as prescribed? Am I abstinent? Am I not using other illicit substance? So basically taking all of this away, from this study that was now was small in size and it was kind of limited in group, basically the primary cluster of patient-derived measures of success are really emotional well-being, decreased drug use, and human functioning. So those are like the big themes that come up. What did you think of that, Sonia? I mean, I think they were all good. You know, there was nothing on these lists that I was surprised that people wanted, but I was surprised at the rank. And when I thought about it, I guess I wasn't surprised. You know, if you don't have housing, it's really hard to do basically anything else. So shocked is the wrong word. But yeah, I was just really surprised that a lot of what I prioritize is not what the patients prioritized. And that's why this article is so interesting and important. Yeah. So like, will these results help me in patient care? I'm an outpatient doctor. I also do inpatient, but I'm mostly an outpatient doctor. Um, you know, treatment goals is something that I come up with every patient. I'm going to be kind of honest. I'd like to say that I do a multidimensional treatment plan. I'm going to throw myself out there. It's probably not as multidimensional as I wish. I think it really uh, focuses on basically decreased drug use, addressing comorbid psychiatric medical conditions, identifying opioid related, like co occurring infectious diseases. I, I treat hepatitis C. And then catching them up on their health care, which they never done. You'd be surprised the number of like 34-year-old female opioid users that have been in 35 MAT programs or MOUD programs, and they've never had a pap smear. So stuff like that, I often kind of will tap in and, and take care of at our visits as you kind of go through your recovery with me. Um, and I do talk about family. I talk about their friends, how they're doing. Although things like housing and kind of like basically social determinants of health, like do they have access to... Um, a job. They, I often kind of haven't prioritized that. And, and it's not like I don't care about that. I, I feel like I, I'm a little more powerless about that. I don't have, I can't put an order in to get someone a house. I can't put an order in to have a meaningful relationship with your family. I can give them the tools to do that, but it's something I ha haven't really spent a, a humongous part of time in terms of the primary treatment plan. Maybe going forward, though, I should start kind of at, trying to add that in. And, and I mean, at least I can talk about it and add that in and, and see if the patient responds or what I can do. And But it's it's something that I, I think maybe should be more so incorporated. And so certainly while this isn't um, practice changing, this is perspective changing for me. Well, it is. And it really brought something home for me. You know, you and I were talking earlier about how I'm taking on a lot of new patients recently. They're coming from other doctors and I'm hearing about all the patients' frustrations with their other doctors. And I've been thinking, why is addiction treatment so annoying for everybody? Why is it not just annoying, but sometimes even traumatizing for the patients? And I think a lot of our addiction treatment strategies, clinics, they just weren't designed with patients' comfort or goals in mind. They were designed from a more punitive model or a model that assumes that the patients have no ability to control themselves, no ability to make choices that benefit them. I mean, that's certainly how our methadone system was designed and a lot of our regulations regarding buprenorphine and just how we think about treatment. It doesn't actually take patients' preferences into account. It takes their well-being into account in a sort of paternalistic way, saying we know what's best for you and here's what will help your health. But it doesn't really take patients' preferences into account. And so this article definitely makes me think more about what do my patients really want and how can I help them meet those goals. And hearing that for a lot of people, maybe total abstinence from drugs is not actually a goal. 
even though that's what we focus on most in our clinics. So thank you, John. That was an awesome article. I really liked hearing it. I liked reading it. And as we said, it gave me a lot to think about. Now it's time for our talk back. But instead of talk back comments from our audience, I wanted to share something with our listeners. I just want to let everyone know there's a new feature on Spotify. If you're a Spotify user where you can leave comments right on the podcast so you can listen to the podcast episode and on Spotify on the app, there's a little Q&A box where you can tell us what you think of the article. So if you're a Spotify listener and you want to do that instead of having to go to a whole new app like Twitter or Facebook, you can send us comments that way. And then another way to talk to us, in case you're listening, we are going to be at ASAM, which is about three weeks after this episode airs. I don't know exactly where you'll find us. We haven't chosen which uh, sessions we're going to go to, but we definitely will be there. Love to talk to anybody who wants to give us some feedback about the podcast or just say hi. Sonia wanted to wear t-shirts too, but we're not wearing t-shirts. Just throwing that out there. Our merch store is still under construction. So if you want an Addiction Medicine Journal Club t-shirt, you'll have to make it yourself. Feel free to bootleg our logo if you're going to do that. Thank you for listening to the Addiction Medicine Journal Club. The best part of any journal club is the conversation, and we want to hear what you have to say. To have your opinions about the articles included in a future episode, send us an email, message us on Twitter or Facebook, join our Facebook group, comment on YouTube, comment on Spotify. The links will all be in the show notes. Our original theme music was composed and performed by Benjamin Kennedy, audio editing by Aaron McHugh, video production by Paul Kennedy, produced by Dr. Patrick Beeman and Ars Longa Media. Addiction Medicine Journal Club is intended for educational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice. The views expressed here are our own and do not necessarily reflect those of our employers or the authors of the articles we review. All patient information has been modified to protect their identities. Thank you for being part of the conversation and have a great day.